All right, I will turn this off. Well, good day. Uh, it's good afternoon here, and whatever time of day it is where you are, I hope it's a good one. My name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the academic director at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. And on behalf of Nasser and the Armenian Film Foundation, the co-sponsor and co-organizer of today's program, thank you for making time in your day for this program. Uh, I must first and foremost recognize and thank our friends at the Armenian Film Foundation, especially Jerry Papazian and Carla Garapedian, for their, as always, enthusiastic and professional collaboration. And indeed, to Carla, go our thanks for proposing this event and having the awareness uh, of the, the uh, significance of today uh, and the centennial that we are marking. I also, of course, want to thank all of our panelists for joining us and to point out to you that we have relevant titles by each of them available in our online bookstore. You see some of them are arrayed on the bookshelf next to me. I uh, encourage you to, to purchase them uh, from us or if you purchase them from somewhere else, nonetheless to purchase them and support their important work and i'll be mentioning some of their their contributions as they get introduced 100 years ago on a street in berlin Solomon Talirian shot and killed talat pasha one of the main architects of the armenian genocide and from that moment on for decades the full story and the full impact and legacy of the killing of talat and of operation nemesis which planned it remained untold or half told or told as a mixture of fact and not quite fact. Uh, I think we will probably hear more about this uh, as, as our program progresses. Eric Bogosian, from whom we shall hear presently, has written that, quote, the men and women of Operation Nemesis did what governments could not. They were appealing to a higher final justice. A few days after Solomon Talirian killed Talat, Shahan Natali, who was, of course, one of the key figures in planning the event, wrote that the killing and the trial which would follow it were, quote, a sacred work of justice, unquote, and that, quote, the German people would learn all that they have no information about, and that indeed the very next day after the event, when the papers in a few lines said that the person killed Talat, was responsible for the massacre of one million Armenians, the people among themselves had come to that conclusion on their own that a just act had taken place right there in Berlin. I quote from Shahan Natali's letter, as it is given in the book, Sacred Justice, the Voices and Legacy of the Armenian Operation Nemesis, another very important contribution on this subject by Marian Mesrobian McCurdy. And I also wanted to show, in the spirit of show and tell, and I realized I should have these things digitized, but I didn't know we had this book until about an hour ago. Uh, we, I have a signed copy of Solomon Talirian's autobiography uh, inscribed by him in the, uh, and dated 1953, the year of its publication. That's the end of my show and tell. Now, before we hear from our four panelists, who will in turn discuss varying aspects of the legacy of, of uh, the killing of Talat and Operation Nemesis, we will watch a short video interview recently done with Edward Alexander, who last year turned 100 years old. I thank Ed and his daughter-in-law, Nasser board member Arlene Sarian Alexander, as well as Carla, for putting this video together. Uh, Ed Alexander is a retired Foreign Service officer who served in Berlin, Budapest, Athens, and Washington. And prior to his career in diplomacy, he spent 10 years at the Voice of America, eventually becoming chief of the Armenian division. Uh, he has served as an Armenian interpreter in the Oval Office for President H.W. Bush and is the author of three books, The Serpent and the Bees, Opus, and A Crime of Vengeance, about the Tellurian trial and the Armenian genocide. And in this short video, well, I don't need to introduce it. It speaks for itself. My father uh, said, said to me and to my mother 
during a week in 1925, uh, the three of us are going to church this Sunday because there's someone I want you to meet. I was uh, five years old and uh, uh, we were standing on line. The church was packed with people who were talking out loud and women were crying of all things. Uh, men were shouting things here and there and so forth. And everybody was waiting in line for someone who was on the stage uh, and the, below the church. Below the church there's a there's sort of a recreation hall. And uh, so we all got on line. And uh, uh, we slowly moved up. And then uh, bef before I knew it, we were in front of whoever it was. And so then my father said, uh, Mr. Tellerian, he said, this is my son. And Tellerian leaned over and kissed me on the forehead. Uh, then he sat back and, uh, and we talked some more. And uh, I apparently asked my father, uh, why are all those people kissing his hand? And my father said then, and I'll never forget this, He's kissing that hand because with that hand he avenged our people. And his name is Solomon Tellerian, and don't you ever forget him. And I never have. After 10 years at the Voice of America, uh, the State Department assigned me my first assignment overseas in Berlin. And that's when I thought to myself, gee, this is where that terrible thing that Dad told me I was never going to think I should never forget, and so uh, I went to Berlin, and uh, and one of the first things that I did was what I always did in my career wherever I went, uh, which was ask, uh, are there any Armenians here? I was always interested in that, and uh, there were, as a matter of fact. It's not a big, not a big colony, not even today, but uh, but there was some. And uh, they were politically oriented. And uh, so one of them said, there's a person here at the Free University. That's the major university in Berlin. And it's a woman, she's on the faculty, and she knows a lot about Armenian affairs. She is, as a matter of fact, the foremost foreign scholar here on Armenian affairs. And her name is Tessa Hoffman. She knew where to go in the archives, and she also advised me about reading press articles about the trial. And then in 1960, after word came that he had died, uh, she got the trial transcript for me. The thought of a, a man who's an open criminal, I mean, what he did was a criminal act, to be absolved of the crime and to come to their verdict in less than an hour showing that they were all very much in favor of this. I knew that uh, I, had to, I had to do some uh, writing, something more serious. I, I originally had thought about a good long essay, but uh, I, could, I couldn't get everything in there. There have been a number of genocides since then, uh, uh, and especially the Nazis, what they did in Auschwitz and elsewhere. So it's always interesting to, to talk about that. Thank you, Ed, for doing that. I hope you're watching. And if you are, thank you so much for that. And I apologize for the technical snafu. So now we'll move to our first speaker, uh, Eric Bogosian. Eric is an acclaimed actor, playwright, and novelist. He was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for his play, Talk Radio, which of course was also made into a film uh, starring the author. He is the author of several other plays, including Suburbia, a number of one-man shows, including Drinking in America and Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, and three novels, including Mall. As an actor, he has a robust career on the large and small screens, and his first work of nonfiction was Operation Nemesis, the assassination plot that avenged the Armenian Genocide, which was published in 2015. And if you don't have a copy, I would encourage you to do so. Eric. Thanks for the introduction, Mark. 
Uh, I am honored to be here today and joining all of you, such um, great company and wonderful to see Ed, who I spoke to when I was working on my book. And uh, I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed with the with the the vibe of this moment. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read mostly here because I want to be able to keep what I'm saying condensed, and I don't want to ramble. Uh, but I will say ahead of time that um, this is an enormous topic. Uh, Mark asked me to talk about the legacy of the um, assassination of Talat. And uh, it's an enormous topic. And uh, I may get a little simplistic here in places for those of you who are serious scholars of uh, Armenian history. And uh, also some of the things I say may be a little controversial. Uh, they're in my book. There's new information coming out all the time. And um, in fact, even as we were speaking just before we began, I learned some things uh, from Mark about it. Okay, so the, the true story of the assassination of Talat Pasha and his cohort uh, was not fully explicated. As Mark said, uh, there's been uh, various stories uh, over the last hundred years. But uh, in 1986, Jacques de Rogy published Operation Nemesis in France. It was later uh, published in English, uh, Resistance and Revenge. And um, when I decided I wanted to get into this, uh, at first it was because I was going to write a screenplay, I, I came upon de Rogi's book and my mind was blown. I mean, I already knew about Sogoman Tetlirion, but I did not know the full scope of Operation Nemesis. And with Aram Arkun's assistance, I was able to translate all sorts of um, material and um, and I enlarged somewhat on DeRoji's research. I didn't expect to be doing that. And then I, I delved in deeper into the involvement of British intelligence in this um, assassination. So Operation Nemesis was very successful. Um, the best known is the killing of Talat, but uh, they also gunned down a host of Turkish leaders who were directly responsible for the attacks on the Armenian civil, uh, civilian population. These would include Talat, Jamal Pasha, Jamal Azmi, Dr. Shakir, Saeed Halim, as well as Khan Javanshir, who was responsible for uh, massacres in Azerbaijan. Uh, Enver Pasha would be gunned down by the Soviets and um, Dr. Nazim, who was another key player in the genocide was hanged by uh, Ataturk. Uh, Ataturk was basically making sure there was nobody left from the old regime. Uh, the legacy would not only be meaningful for Armenians, it's, it also uh, would change world history. And I'll get to that in a second. The first thing to note though, is that the term revenge is too uh, vague to talk about what, what these people were doing. One of the really important things that uh, Armin Garo and Shahan Natalie, who were pretty much running Operation Nemesis, were concerned about was that if Talat and his ilk got back in power, they would continue to persecute Armenians. They would finish the job, so to speak. And the, so they wanted to be sure that these men would never get back to power again. Inadvertently, though, they cleared the way for uh, General uh, Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk, to take power because in fact, these were this was his competition. And once all these people were pushed out of the way, Ataturk in 1922, as he entered Smyrna, would uh, succeed in being the leader of the new Republic of Turkey. Um, and it's maybe important, and, and it is important to understand that it is possible that British intelligence assisted in this assassination of Talat because they saw him as a troublemaker and Kamal was a much more pragmatic leader. We do know that there were secret uh, discussions between the British and Kamal as the war, as the civil war right after World War I was happening in Turkey. And the end result, because I think you always have to look, you know, where's the money, is that the oil lands, the very significant oil lands, um, oil fields of formerly Mesopotamia, we now call it Iraq, uh, went into the hands of the British, French, and the Americans. Uh, and that's a whole other story, but that happened. Uh, interestingly, the country of Iraq was established on March 16th, 
1921, the day after uh, Talat was murdered. Uh, that was Gertrude Bell in Cairo. Um, so we have these patriots, the members of Operation Nemesis, who are, goes beyond uh, Tetlerion, but Tetlerion really inspires the whole force to continue hunting down these, um, these criminals. And um, for, for decades, this is a, this is a uh, something that inspires the revolutionary aspects of the Armenian community, the ARF particularly. And most of them by, by after 1920 or so, uh, there, there's been a big movement into Lebanon and Lebanon becomes a kind of a hotbed of this kind of militant activity. And so they can keep looking at these, these patriots, which include Misak Torlakian and Arshavir Sheregian, uh, as uh, these, are the, these are inspirational figures for the Armenian resistance. And it is seen as a uh, beyond patriotic because Armenia is now part of the Soviet Union and they don't like that. They want to get Armenia back independent from the Soviet Union. And so in a way, these players are fighting the Soviet Union. They're kind of fighting the whole world. There's a schism in the Armenian community worldwide in 1933 after Archbishop Torian is murdered in the United States and uh, the Tashnags, the ARF become really a separate uh, group. So when Ataturk uh, dies in 1938 and then there's World War II, after World War II, the Turks really ramp up the denialistic approach, the, the end game for genocide. They um, they spend lots and lots of money, millions of dollars, and put all kinds of resources to keep pushing the idea that the genocide really never happened. And this inspires resistance on the part of the Armenian community all over the world. Um, the flashpoint would be when um, Gergen Yanikian uh, murders two Turkish uh, diplomats in California in 1973. And from there, we start to see uh, the really intense Armenian uh, militant, violent activity that would come through Asala and, um, and uh, the Justice Commandos and other groups. And these people were definitely inspired by Operation Nemesis and were very, very uh, active in the late 70s and 1980s. Uh, hundreds of bombings, dozens of people killed. This is Armenian attacks on Turks. And also, the Armenians, the ARF begins to reveal the story of Operation Nemesis in, in little tiny dribs and drabs. The first thing we even hear about, really, as far as I know, our Armenian uh, violent activity, ARF activity, is 1948, Armin Garo publishes Bank Ottoman, which is about the Bank Ottoman attack that took place in 1896. And this is... Um, this is in Armenian. Everything comes out in Armenian. It's sort of a code. Uh, then Aram Yerganian's memoir, We Killed This Way, is published by Shahan Natali in 1949 and 1953. The Course of My Life, Misak Torlakian. Then in 1953, also Titlerian's memoir was published in Cairo, again in Armenian. Sharakian publishes Memoirs of an Armenian Patriot. Arshavir Sharakian. Uh, took down, I think, three of the uh, Turks. And um, that would come out as the legacy in 1976 in English. One thing to look at is as these men are aging and passing away, more and more information is coming out and is being publicly available because after all, there is no statute of limitations for uh, what they had been doing in 1921 and 1922. And they had been hiding out since 1922 because the ARF had told them to stand down and they did. Um, and of course, Edward's book in 1991, Edward Alexander, who you just saw, A Crime of Vengeance. And, um, and so Gorgon Yunikian kills these uh, Turkish consuls and uh, vice consul in 1973 and inspires uh, this violence. And it gets more and more intense I really think that there's a there's 
a lot of research that needs to be done here as far as the uh, CIA supporting this effort and the um, KGB supporting the PLO and in a way kind of a proxy war occurring in the Middle East. But I don't, I'm not expert on this, I just suspect it. And um, in 1991, the Republic of Armenia is established, there's the Soviet Union ends, and there's no reason to really keep up this fight with the Soviet Union, as well as the fact that a lot of these revolutionary groups start basically eating their young and destroying themselves, and they all basically go out of business. And not without really, really upsetting the Turks through this whole period, because they want to know why it hasn't the CIA or the FBI caught these guys? And that's an interesting question. Um, but the legacy continues after that. Unfortunately, the violence, the chain of violence continues with the uh, murder of Harant Dink in 2007, a man who should have won the Nobel Peace Prize if anyone ever should have. And the, there are people who believe that the methodology used or the way that Dink was killed in Istanbul uh, was meant to signify a link to the way Talat was murdered from behind and to the back of the head. I, I just wanna say this last statement and then I'll be done. Um, ultimately, the legacy of Operation Nemesis went beyond revenge. It went beyond the bounds of what is legal, lawful, or a sin against God. The action taken by the men and women of Operation Nemesis was in response to a crime beyond the imagination. It was not simply a matter of the sheer numbers of innocent victims or the mind-boggling violence wreaked upon them. Rather, it was the attempt of genocide. That, that is to say the very attempt to erase a people from the face of the earth, their lives, their homes, their churches, their places of business, their culture, even their language, their religion. All of this was the target of the, the Turkish effort. And so, what Operation Nemesis was doing was existential. They weren't just avenging these murders. They were saying, we exist. We as a people exist. See what we can do. We, we responded. And we memorialized the million and a half people who died. And that's really important because all of us live in a world uh, that has been made by those who came before us the dead, the books we read, the buildings we live in, uh, the culture we share is all the product of the dead. And the only way we can really respect them is to memorialize them. And so Operation Nemesis had was in effect memorializing, saying, we haven't forgotten you, we remember you, we exist. And that's the legacy. Eric, thank you so much. And I had the great honor, I don't remember what year this was, Eric, five years ago or so, but when we were in uh, Fresno uh, for, for an event to, to accompany Eric to uh, the grave of Solomon Tellerian, which was a very, uh, very moving experience indeed, and uh, unexpectedly so in, in, in certain ways. Um, thank you again. Our second speaker is Dr. Philippe Saint, who is the professor, who is professor of law and director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals in the faculty at uh, University College London. He has previously held academic positions at the University of London's School of Oriental and Asian Studies, King's College London, University of Cambridge, and New York University. He frequently advises governments, international organizations, NGOs, and private sector on aspects of international law. He is the author of numerous books on interna international law, including Lawless World and Torture Team, and his book, East West Street, which I strongly recommend to, to anyone watching, uh, on the or East West Street on the Origins of Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity was published in 2016 and, and has been awarded numerous prizes. His latest book is entitled The Rat Line, Love, Lies, and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive, which The Guardian has called mesmerizing and The New York Times merely brilliant. So uh, I would strongly urge you to 
to check that book out as well. And again, uh, both of these books are, are available through through Nasser and at many other fine booksellers. So now, please welcome Philippe Sant. Thank you, Mark. And it's incredibly nice to be um, part of this event. I'm, in a sense, an interloper because I don't have um, Armenian connections. Um, I come to this from a very different perspective. You touched on one of my activities, which is uh, working as a barrister. Uh, in fact, I've spent uh, most of today sitting here in my office in London at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, uh, arguing a case for Sol Somalia against Kenya. And uh, one of the categories of cases that I work on is um, cases of mass murder, crimes against humanity and genocide. Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Kosovo, Cambodia, um, South America. I mean, there have been too many, and more recently, of course, in northern Iraq and the Yazidis. And last year, I found myself at the International Court of Justice sitting about three feet from um, Aung San Suu Kyi, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 2012. She was at the court acting, representing her country, Myanmar. She was free then, sort of. Uh, and I was counsel for the Gambia, small African country, which had brought a case against Myanmar alleging that Myanmar was perpetrating a genocide against uh, a part of its community known as the Rohingya, a Muslim community in Myanmar. And sitting there listening to Aung San Suu Kyi uh, argue her case for Myanmar, I thought back to the extraordinary circumstances that brought us all to The Hague in December 2019. None of this would have happened but for a convention the first modern human rights treaty adopted in 1948 called the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, which criminalizes the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. It was a landmark treaty um, adopted two years after the end of the Nuremberg trial. It was the brainchild of a single man uh, called Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jewish lawyer, a man who'd been a public prosecutor in Warsaw when and a private lawyer by the time the Germans invaded in 1939. And so I knew all about the origins generally of the Genocide Convention and its parallel crimes against humanity. Genocide is about protecting groups, crimes against humanity is about protecting individuals. But I didn't really know all of the personal detail. And you'll see how this leads to the story of Sogomon area. In the spring of 2010, I was invited to give a lecture at the law faculty of a university in Western Ukraine in a city today called Lviv. It used to be called Lemberg when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And before uh, and after that, it was Lvov when it was part of Poland until it was once again conquered first by the Soviets, then by the Germans, and then became part of the Soviet Union until that collapsed in 1991. And I was invited to give a lecture because of the cases that I do on genocide. And the faculty said, come to Lviv and give a lecture on the cases that you do on genocide and crimes against humanity. I didn't have a burning desire to give a lecture, but I did have a burning desire to find the house where my grandfather was born in the city of Lemberg in 1904. I knew my grandfather very well. He lived until 1997. And he'd been born in this city, but he'd never spoken about it to me ever in the 38 years that I knew him. Because as I learned in the researches that followed, his entire family had been killed um, by Nazis and by Ukrainians uh, in the summer of 1942, when Germany uh, took over again, um, the city of Lviv Lemberg. So I go to Lviv in October, 2010, and I arrive with an extraordinary story because in the course of the summer, I have discovered that Raphael Lemkin, the man who invented the concept of genocide had been to the university, the law faculty that had invited me to talk about genocide. And they didn't know that the origins of genocide were from a man who was an alumnus of that very university. So I got more and more interested and I dug deeper and deeper into Raphael Lemkin and his relationship to the city of Lemberg and to the law faculty in Lviv. 
And eventually I came across his university papers. He was born in 1900, he, 1901. He arrived in um, Lemberg and Lvov in 1921 in the autumn. And he took a whole series of classes. And in his unpublished memoirs much later, he told a story of how he became interested in inventing this concept of genocide. And I'm gonna to read to you from, from East West Street, my book that deals with this. He never names the professor in the law faculty at Lviv with whom he has this conversation. Um, and it was left to my detective work to find out who it was. The conversation in the class was prompted in the autumn of 1921 and in the following year, by the famous trial that Eric has been talking about. And what a thrill to be here with Eric and Mark and Stefan and, 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 and Carla um, and, and, and each of you. Um, he was in class when the trial was reported in the newspapers in Lvov, Lemberg. And it led to a very animated conversation in class, which he recorded. Now, one of the things about Lemkin you need to understand is he was a slight fantasist and he did tend to embellish things. As we say, in the East End of London, he told porky pies, sort of little white lies. But he did record this story in different guises in numerous forms. And here goes the conversation that Lemkin has. On Lemkin's account of an exchange with one professor, which cannot be verified, the argument escalated into a grand epiphanic moment. Did the Armenians ever try to have the Turk arrested for the massacre? There wasn't any law under which he could be arrested, the professor replied. Not even though he had a part in killing so many people, Lemkin countered. Let's take the case of a man who owns some chickens, the professor retorted. He kills them. Why not? It's not your business. If you interfere, it's trespass. The Armenians were not chickens, Lemkin said sharply. The professor allowed the youthful comment to pass, then changed tack. When you interfere with the internal affairs of a country, you infringe upon that country's sovereignty. So, Lemkin asks, it's a crime for Tellerian to strike down one man, but not a crime for that man to have struck down one million men. The professor shrugs his shoulders. Lemkin is young and excited. If you knew something about international law, the professor tells Lemkin. And that was the conversation. Was the account accurate? Lemkin returned to this exchange throughout his life, explaining that the Tellerian trial totally changed his life. It was a moment of absolutely vital change. When I was then researching the book, I went to meet a friend of mine in New York, late wonderful Bob Silvers, the editor of uh, the New York Review of Books, who had been a student at law school in Yale in 1949. And unbelievably, he was taught by Raphael Lemkin. And Lemkin, Silvers, Silvers says to me, yeah, he, he told us that story too. And he explained how his invention of the concept of genocide, I've got a recording actually of my conversation with Bob Silvers on that. I'm seeing your face, Eric, and I've got a recording of my conversation with Bob Silvers. He says, my whole life changed. And I never forgot, he says, Lemkin says, about that trial. And then of course, we went into the 1930s. I became a public prosecutor. I started writing about it. And then the terrible events, of the Second World War happened against the Poles, against the Jews, against Roma, against Armenians, against others. Millions of people were killed. And I thought, no, I'm not going to curl up in a corner and weep. I'm going to do something to change the world. Because at that point, in 1939, the professor was right. International law allowed a state to treat its citizens as it wished. If you wanted to kill 10 million people, there was no rule of international law which said you couldn't do that. That's effectively the argument that Aung San Suu Kyi was still making in 2019 at the International Court of Justice. And in the summer of 1944, Lemkin changes the world. You do a show and tell, I'm gonna do it also. I wasn't gonna do this, Mark, but since you did it, I'm gonna do it. He published this book. Uh, I don't know if you can say, oh, it's not quite, um, 
it's 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 out of focus sorry it's um uh that you, you've got it you've got it there no 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 oh well it's um it's axis rule in occupied europe not the sexiest of book titles it has to be said actually this copy is very special you won't be able to see it either but it's signed by lemkin in nuremberg in 1946. he invents the word in 1944 he gets a great review in the new york uh, times front page um book review i become fascinated by this i spend time in colombia which has a small archive including this extraordinary document that I found in the, um, in the archive uh, at Columbia University. Um, I, I hope you can see that. Uh, this is a, a handwritten note by Raphael Lemkin. It dates to about the spring of 1944. And you see he has written the word genocide and lots of other words about 25 times and he has written it here you can see it on the left hand side um, you see this is the first known writing of the word genocide in Lemkin's own hand he tries to get the um he tries to get the word genocide into the Nuremberg statute he fails in the summer of 45, working with Robert Jackson. He flies himself to London in October, in, in September 1945, to get the word genocide into the indictment, and he gets it into the indictment against the 24 Nazis on trial at Nuremberg. It is argued at the Nuremberg trial, but the Americans are against the concept, along with the British. The Americans, because they're worried it's going to be used in relation to American Indians and it's going to be used in relation to blacks in the southern states. The southern senators oppose the term genocide and the British oppose because they think it'll be used by the former subjects of their colonies. No mention of the word genocide in the famous Nuremberg judgment. In October 1946, Lemkin picks him up off the floor. He goes to Paris. He gets the General Assembly at its first meeting to uh, agree that there will be a convention adopted on genocide. And two years later, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide is adopted. All of this because of the work that Carla and Eric and Mark and others and Edward have done, focusing on what happened in that seminal moment on the 15th of March, 1921. So whatever its rights and wrongs, whatever the merits of taking justice into one's own hand may be, as Eric said, that single act of killing changed the world and allowed me, for example, to sit in a courtroom in December with Aung San Suu Kyi, allows the argument to be made today that the treatment, for example, by the Chinese of the Uyghurs is contrary to international law, and so on and so forth. I had no idea when I started my project in 2010. I'd worked already on genocide for years. This is why I'm so happy to be with you today. And I thank you warmly for the possibility of being with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I both of, of uh, both Eric and and Philip's presentations, as well as uh, Ed Alexander's uh, video, remind us that th this past that we're talking about, we're very closely connected to it. It it it's a hundred years ago, which in historical terms is either a long time or not a long time, depending on on who you ask. But uh, we are not so removed from it, and the connections are really quite extraordinarily close, uh, as, as we keep hearing. So let us go to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Stefan Erich, who is professor of history at the University of Haifa, and where he is joining us uh, this evening for him, and director of the Haifa Center for German and European Studies, as well as the co-editor of the Journal of Holocaust Research. He's the author of several books, The German Language, Who Are the Moldovans, from 2008, Ataturk in the Nazi Imagination, published by Harvard University Press in 2014, and Justifying Genocide, which you can see over my shoulder, I believe, uh, Germany and the Armenians from Bismarck to Hitler, published by Harvard University Press in 2016. And for the latter, uh, we were very honored to, to award 
uh, Stefan with the 2017 Sona Oronian Book Prize for Excellence in Armenian Studies. And it's a pleasure to have him back with us today. Stefan. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for being able to be here. It's not easy to go after Eric and Philip now, um, but I'm trying to talk about a different perspective, a different angle, and I'm skipping over my Lemkin parts in the presentation. Um, <clears throat> as you might know, I analyzed how the Armenian genocide was debated in Germany at the time. I found that there was a long and drawn out debate in Germany in the post-war years from 1919 to 1923. Um, a debate about genocide, about the Armenian genocide for about four years, and this in a time just about uh, 10 years before Hitler came to power. I also argue that this was the first larger debate on genocide um, as such in the public sphere. Uh, anywhere ever in history. There were other debates, of course, about the Armenian genocide, but in Germany, it really turned to the nature of genocide, uh, motivations, um, uh, how it was uh, um, executed, um, testimonies, and all these implications. The assassination of Talat Pasha was really crucial in this debate. <clears throat> Why? Because it opened up the debate again. By early 1921, this debate had already run its course, or so it seemed. And secondly, why it's important, it changed the nature of this debate. The key word here is justificationalism. It's a very clumsy word, I admit that, but I feel it's necessary. We have denialism, <clears throat> we know what that is, and here actually we're going a step further, justificationalism. Why? Because the events of 1921 transformed the debate in such a way that now genocide was openly justified in Germany. Papers on the right of the spectrum argued that under such and comparable circumstances, yes, it was okay and justifiable and even right to commit genocide. So that you understand how Talat Pasha's assassination and the trial, how it pushes this debate, and it's not instrumental in, in what do you say, in taking responsibility for this push. This, there is a, a very own German background to all of this and how it unfolds. So let's sketch the overall debate. First, after World War I ended, you can imagine, Germany had a lot on its plate, <clears throat> and it was mostly pro-Armenian activists that tried to lobby German and international opinion, mostly to help Armenian survivors, and also to uh, lobby the United States to take on uh, a mandate over Armenia. But this was rather low key, in the sense that no cross paper uh, discussion developed. <clears throat> it wasn't really a mainstream topic in the beginning. And then com comes the intervention of the German Foreign Office. The German Foreign Office, as well as parts of the German government, were afraid that the Allies, the Entente, sitting in session in Paris after World War I, were going to use the Armenian genocide against Germany. You know, Germany felt it had already enough on its plate. Now the Armenian genocide can be and uh, will be a topic as well. So they tasked somebody to publish documents from their own correspondence of the German Foreign Office, of the various diplomats, consuls, the ambassador, back and forth in the Ottoman Empire from the time of the genocide. The goal was to show that Germany was innocent of having instigated the Armenian genocide. And the amazing thing, I think, that they got Johannes Lepsius to do this, to do this publication for them, because Johannes Lepsius, as you I'm sure are aware, is the absolute giant of German um, Armenian, um, uh, of the absolute giant of the topic in uh, Germany already for decades by this point. He had already published his own report on the Armenian massacres of the 1890s and of the Armenian genocide itself. Both times he had traveled to the Ottoman Empire and during World War I, uh, as you know, he famously pleaded with Enver Pasha to stop the genocide, as is immortalized in Franz Werfel's 40 Days of Musada, based on Lepsius's own uh, description of this conversation. So during World War I, Johannes Lepsius had published his own report on the Armenian genocide, circumventing censorship, <clears throat> but successfully reaching all the main politicians, parliamentarians, journalists, and almost all of the Protestant parishes in Germany. So people, while the Armenian genocide was going on, could have known quite a lot about it. 
And with all this authority then, Lepsius now in 1919 publishes this collection of diplomatic texts. So what came of it? <clears throat> it basically failed insofar as it didn't convince the world that Germany was innocent, but it convinced the Entente to leave the topic off the list against Germany in Paris. And, and I imagine this was Lepsius's main motivation, he succeeded in making this a really known topic inside of Germany. Even before the book was published, a cross-paper debate ensued, excerpts were published, testimonies, um, and for some time the Armenian genocide became a major topic in Germany. And as I said, the whole range of what you can imagine a debate about genocide would talk about the overall intent to kill a whole population, <clears throat> um, economic considerations, um, and so on and so forth. And then already you had these divisions in German uh, public, in the German public sphere between parts of the press that were more pro-Ottoman, mostly trying to minimize what had happened, finding excuses such as military necessity. And then you had another side that was ready to accept these charges and uh, deal with them also on the moral philosophical uh, plane. So <clears throat> as it played out, the denialists had the last word. They kept publishing long after the pro-Armenian voices were silent. And by early 1921, the debate just seemed to naturally have petered out. Then Talat Pasha was killed. And it didn't really bring the Armenian topic back. The German press mostly tried to ignore this topic and just lauded and celebrated Talat Pasha as a great ally and a true friend of Germany. He was laid to rest and everybody hoped this topic was finally over now. But then came the trial, as you all know, in the summer of 1921. <clears throat> Again, the German government and the foreign office were very interested and very scared of this topic. And they tried to exert pressure that it be a short trial and not very political. They succeeded with the one and spectacularly failed with the other. The trial only lasted one and a half days, but I would argue easily one of the most spectacular trials of the 20th century. <clears throat> and we don't know much, we are speculating always, but perhaps part as an adverse reaction to the political pressure, perhaps as a result of the previous intensive debate in the press, the judge turned the trial around on Talat Pasha right from the beginning. Even before the charges were read out, this judge by the name of Lemberg, to connect actually to <laughs> Philip's uh, point uh, by the name of Lemberg, focuses on Talat Pasha and the Armenian genocide much less about what actually happened uh, on the street in Berlin. And as you know, the jury acquitted Telerian. Much is made out of the um, uh, idea uh, that there was something like temporary insanity uh, uh, or something like that uh, motivating the jury, but we don't have the reasoning. They just said not guilty. And I feel looking at the trial uh, documents, this was much more a political and a historical trial than anything else. Now, this was really a shock for the German public sphere. The newspapers, you know, at the time had morning, midday and evening editions, and then they had covered the trial extensively. And then all of a sudden, they just stop, not guilty, and the article is kind of, you know, it just stops as if they were too much in shock to deliberate on what they thought, what, what we should think about this. So now they felt they had some work to do. And now, actually, this uh, debate after the trial goes on for weeks and months. The last resumes of, you know, what to think of this trial come out only in March the next year, one year after Talat Pasha was killed. Again, they printed witness accounts, testimonies, new testimonies as well. They focused again on Johannes Lepsius, Limon von Sanders, all these people there. But now there was a major shift, a tectonic shift, I would argue. The papers who had previously engaged in denialism now all accepted the charge of genocide. There was so much information out there, they couldn't you know, uh, get around it anymore. They accepted this in their arguments and in their essays. Um, genocide in the words of the day, murder of a people with full intent. So this is an interesting shift, you know, and we might think it's a good thing. They accept what happened, historic facts. But then what did they do with this? They continued with similar arguments as they had done before. And now they just went basically overboard. They accepted the charge, 
but justified what happened. So this is also where you have the uh, title of my book, Justifying Genocide. It basically, this is the moment uh, where this happens. <clears throat> if before the trial, <clears throat> these claims of military or national or racial necessity had been applied to some minimalist scenario of dying and killing, now it was really applied to genocide. And because of the nature of the debate and the kind of global arguments that were put forward, that could also apply to other scenarios. And I don't have time to go here into the whole German tradition of perceiving the Armenians as Jews, basically the Jews of the Orient and of people always having this parallel kind of perspective on things. <clears throat> but some commentators, some contemporaries saw this immediately and saw how dangerous these lines of argumentation and justifications were. And also no time here, but the Nazis also discussed this. You know, they had their papers, they had their speeches at their publications at this time. And they discussed this and other parts of recent Turkish history and put forward lessons to be learned. In 1926, a German Jewish author by the name of Siegfried Lichtenstetter published a book, Antisemitica, where he criticizes the new far right, violent um, racial uh, identity and anti Semitism. Uh, in this book, 1926, he warns that if these lessons as put forward by the far right and the Nazis were these Turkish lessons would ever be translated into reality, it would mean that the Jews of Germany and Austria would be killed and their property given to Aryans. So you see, I wanted now to talk about Lemkin, but we did that already. There are these very specific dimensions also uh, in German history for this. It didn't just take place in Berlin. It's also a very important piece, I would argue, of uh, the history of Weimar Germany and also of National Socialism and the far right in these years. Thank you. Stefan, thank you very much. And let us now turn to Carla, Dr. Carla Garapedian, uh, earned a PhD in international relations at the London School of Economics before working as a producer, director, and correspondent based in London. She has received the Armin T. Wegner Humanitarian Award, the AGBU Generation Next Community Hero Award, and the Clara Barton Medal of Gratitude from the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute in Yerevan. She is well known as the director of the film Screamers, and her other film works include Lifting the Veil, about the treatment of women in Afghanistan, and Iran Undercover, about the underground student movement in Iran. She worked closely with the late J. Michael Hogopian on his Witnesses trilogy, and she serves on the board of directors of the Armenian Film Foundation, which was, which was started by the late Michael Hogopian and which is based in Thousand Oaks, California. And she's uh, always a pleasure to have and to work with uh, on any kind of program. So thank you for being with us, Carla, today. Thank you. That's a really big compliment. Thank you, Mark. And back at you. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you all a, a kind of brief survey of the popular culture that has emerged around the shooting of Talat Pasha, the trial of Solomon Talarian, and the nemesis group. It's not meant to be exhaustive in any way, um, and it's not even meant to be an endorsement. Um, it's rather to outline certain trends in the last century, bringing us up to where we are now. And by popular culture, I mean interpretations of the 1921 event in um, books, plays, novels, movies, and documentaries. And the main languages I'm covering are essentially English with some German and French, and just one source is in Armenian. So there's gonna be a lot more in Armenian, which I'm not going to cover. And I'd like to break up this uh, discussion, this survey into four periods. The first period I'll call the aftermath, which we've just heard a little bit about in Germany. Um, there was significant press coverage of the trial in 1921 in newspapers around the world, not just Germany. And now I'm going to experiment on sharing my screen and I'm going to pull up one of the first, um, there it is. Um, that is uh, the cover of the stenographic, uh, the transcript of the German trial. Um, it was actually published in 1921 and it had a forward, as you can see there, Armin Wegner, 
Um, and uh, of course it was in German. And that meant that, um, you know, most people in around the world did not see this. And if you were to try to get your hands on this uh, document right now, you'd find it very difficult to get your hands on it. This actually does not belong to me, it's borrowed. Um, but I was really excited when I saw it. Um, and the point is, is that in this immediate afterwards, after math, um, there weren't a lot of things to read about Operation Nemesis. And why? Well, um, it was secret. <laughs> so obviously, um, there wouldn't be a whole lot. And as Eric mentioned, it would really, there was a period of silence. It would only be about 35 years later that we would see anything. And that uh, this, the, this is the 1956 edition. It first came out in 1953. This is the autobiography of Solomon Talarian. Uh, but that book, I would argue, stayed mainly in the Armenian community. Talarian's story would really only get attention in the English language uh, the year that he died, four years later, in, sorry, two years, four years later, sorry, in 1960. Uh, and the Armenian Review devoted a special issue to Talarian in that year. So in other words, Talarian's death opened the door to a more thorough public discussion of Nemesis. And it was really only right after his death that we got the first popular book, The Cross and the Crescent by Lindy Avakian in Fresno. Uh, this was a dramatized account of the shooting and trial that was very impressionistic based on conversations and anecdotes. But many folks bought that book. And you'll probably find a copy if you're Armenian in your grandparents' bookshelves, which takes us to the second period. And uh, I would call that period bracketed from the mid 70s to 1991. I'd call it the Asala period between 1973 and 91. As Eric uh, told you, there was this series of brutal killings of Turkish diplomats and bombings around the world by. Asala and the Justice Commandos. Uh, so what effect was that on the popular culture? Well, interestingly, the Talarian trial of 1921 came back into focus in this period. And Notable, Notable was one of the first memoirs in English. Here it is, The Legacy by Nemesis member Arshavir Shiragya, and Eric Bogosian also mentioned this book. And this took us inside the Nemesis operation from one of its key members. And in this same period, the Asala period, we also saw the first movie. Herar Tukanyan made Assignment Berlin in 1982. Now, Tukanyan, who was originally from Lebanon, he had really hoped for a big movie production budget from MGM, but he settled for a more, a more modest production filmed entirely in Detroit and financed by um, Detroit Armenians. I remember seeing this movie when I was a girl in Los Angeles, and I won't tell you how long ago that was. The Asal Asala period, though, was really marked, I would argue, by the work of Vartkes Yegiayan, a lawyer fascinated with Talarian and Nemesis, partly because Vartkes Yegiayan knew Talarian. Yegiayan published the first transcript of the Talarian trial in English in 1985. Here, here you'll see an early edition of that book. It was the first time most people in the world, including Armenians, could see for themselves what was actually said in court in 1921, because most people did not have access to that German transcript. Now, Sogoman Talarian had asked Vartkes to translate his autobiography, but Vartkes preferred translating the trial. Vartkes would go on later to publish a book about Misak Torlakian, as well as transcripts about the uh, Trial of the Young Turks in Turkey itself. This was an early version of one of those books. And Varkas also published the uh, British Foreign Office dossiers on Turkish war criminals, also called the Malta Trials. And the important note is that these translated trial records and inside stories, they were important for scholarly research, but they also captured the imagination of many Armenians in the diaspora they essentially became the stuff of popular culture. And for many, understanding Nemesis, it actually became a hobby. Jacques de Rogier's book, which Eric also mentioned, Resistance and Revenge, it also came out in this Asala period, an important addition to the understanding of who was who in Nemesis, including Armengaro and Shahan Natalie. 
And it's towards the end of this period that we had Ed Alexander's book, Crime of Vengeance in 1991. Now, Ed was one of the first to get into the court files about the trial in Berlin, which at that time when Ed was in Berlin were actually housed in East Germany. So the fact that he was able to see some of them, that was a major achievement. And if you were to go to Berlin today, you would find those same documents um, in Berlin relatively accessible now. And finally, in this Asala period, we saw the first major feature film that referenced the shooting and trial, Mayrik. Now, this was Henri Voronoi's semi-autographical film, biographical film. And as many of you will know, if you've seen the film, the Tolarian trial starts the movie. And you know, this film was very successful in France and well-known in the Armenian diaspora, but it wasn't released with English subtitles until 25 years later. And while reference to the Tolarian trial is rather short, the film itself is still a classic. Now that takes us to the next period, the 90s. And I would argue that the 90s were all about Armenians telling their personal stories. Now, Peter Balakian opened that door. He didn't write directly about Nemesis or Tolarian, but he prepared the ground for an interest in things Armenian with his heart-wrenching memoir, The Black Dog of Fate. And then later with this book, Armenian Golgotha, he put on the record his great uncle, Grigoras Balakian's eyewitness account of the genocide, which included being a witness in the Tolarian trial. Now, Balakian's testimony is eye-opening. And in some ways, it's part of the way that trial shifted. And, and I think as Stefan intimated, there was a lot that happened in that trial that was unexpected, including Balakian's testimony. Now that brings us to the next period, what I call the millennium period. Samantha Power's book, A Problem from Hell, changed the game. It started with the first chapter called A Crime with No Name, all about Sogomon Talarian and the trial. Now, interestingly, Samantha Power knew Peter Balakian, and Peter gave her some research and, and tips about how to get into the Armenian subject. Samantha Power brought into the mix Raphael Lemkin, who was influenced by the Tolarian trial, as we heard from Philippe Song, particularly with regard to the law or the absence of law for punishing the perpetrators of genocide. Now, Samantha Power's book linked the nemesis story to the wider issue of human rights and the concept of crimes against humanity. And that made a difference in the public discourse about the Armenian genocide. It opened the door to my documentary, Screamers, co-produced by the BBC in 2006. And arguably that film would not have been made without Samantha Power's book. The Tolarian trial, that was in one part of the film in the context of the fight for justice by Armenian genocide survivors. This was the millennium theme, linking Tolarian to the idea of restorative justice. Now the new millennium, it also saw the beginning of the German influence on the public discourse about the Armenian genocide and about Nemesis. Two important books, Operation Nemesis by Rolf Hosfeld and the collection of German Foreign Office documents on the Armenian Genocide, published in English by Wolfgang Gust, first in German, of course, but then in English. The English version, I would argue, did have an effect on the way Armenians around the world looked at the Armenian Genocide and, and looked at the German role generally. For the first time, I saw a play about the Tolarian trial, and that play was in Berlin with German, not Armenian actors. Other plays about the trial would follow in Russia, Italy, and Armenia itself. And also in Germany in this period, the millennium period, came the documentary by Eric Friedler, Agat, which arguably led the way to German recognition of their complicity in the Armenian genocide later in 2016. Eric Friedler knew all about the Tolarian trial and in fact interviewed members of the Tolarian family. In the ramp up to the 100th commemoration in 2015, Sacred Justice by Marion McCurdy came out, a book that Mark showed you earlier. And this was an important new perspective on the supporters behind Nemesis. 
And interestingly, in this period, we saw for the first time two graphic novels, Mission Speciale in France, in France, and here's the second one, Operation Nemesis in the United States, um, produced by Dave Krikorian, and it was drawn by Josh Blaylock. Graphic novels were a new way to tell the story to a younger audience. And what followed these books were a host of websites devoted to Operation Nemesis, pro-Armenian and anti-Armenian. And as we move towards the end of the teams, Robert Gadigian's films in France, Army of Crime, in Histoire de Fou, excuse my French, also showed the influence of Tolarian and Nemesis in feature films. And last but certainly not least, we had Eric Bogosian's popular book, Operation Nemesis in 2017. Why do I include that in this discussion of popular culture? Well, because readers, I would argue, picked up that book for general interest, not because they knew anything about Sogomon Tolarian or Nemesis, but because they were generally intrigued. What better way to reach readers? In sum, I'm gonna get back to me. I did it. Um, I mean, in the last century, we've had an impressive array of material about Nemesis and Tolarian. And this year, I think we're almost going back to where we started. We'll soon see an English translation of Tolarian's autobiography for the first time. And it's an impressive record for sure. But, but for me personally, as a filmmaker, something is still missing. For me, it's going back to that trial in Berlin. The lawyers, who were they? Who were the jurors, the judge? We know the witnesses who appeared, but there were others who didn't testify. Who were they? There was huge pressure in Weimar Germany, as we just heard. Did this have anything to do with why the trial was so short? Yes, as we've heard, but what were the details of that? After all, this was not just a trial about Armenians. Put Tolarian and Nemesis to one side. This was a trial about Germany 12 years before Hitler came to power. What did Germans learn about that? Or from the trial, what didn't they learn? That story, I would argue, needs to be told because that story belongs not only to Germany, but to Armenians and to the world. Which is why this year I'm in production for a new movie called Nemesis 1921. It's a crime drama for movies at theaters near you from a lawyer's point of view, a crime drama. We're used to that grammar. What will be the impact? Well, I'm not sure, but expect some controversy. And one thing is for certain, it won't be the last of Nemesis, trust me. Thank you, Carla, and thank you for that uh, that teaser. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know that everyone watching is uh, going to want to know the answer to this question, which you may not have an answer to, but I'll ask anyway. Do you know when? Uh, when when can we expect to uh, setting aside COVID? When can we expect to go to theaters near us and and see this? Well, um, 2022 is the year. So the important okay. thing was to be in production on uh, in the year of the hundredth anniversary, and so and so. Thankfully, thankfully we are fingers and toes crossed. Very good. <laughs> so, uh, if I did not mention this at the outset, I apologize. But for those in the audience who want to ask questions, please use the Zoom Q and A function. Type it send it and I will ask it if it is on topic. Uh, and there is a question actually, which I will address because I'm not sure it's quite on topic, but nevertheless, it's of interest about uh, Dr. Uh, Rupin Sevag's wife who was Swiss. And um, I wanted to mention to the, to the person who asked that question that there is a very good article uh, by Tanner Akjam uh, published oh, maybe 10 years ago, called the, the Chilingirian murder, uh, which is the real name of Rupan Sevag, a case study from the 1915 roundup of Armenian intellectuals that I strongly suspect will, will answer your questions about that. Um, and I want to say thank you to the people who have submitted comments on YouTube 
and on Zoom, uh, expressing their appreciation for for the uh, for the panelists, which I want to uh, underscore as well. And we have people today from all over the United States, Armenia, Germany, Netherlands, Scandinavia, Argentina, Canada, Turkey. Uh, we thank you all for being with us today. Uh, okay, here come the questions. Uh, the question is this, um, this is from a young woman and I will give, give her name, Serena Bush. She is a, uh, Jerusalemite Armenian who has made a documentary film about the assassination and trial. Uh, and she says, what strikes me is nationalism, something I see a lot of in my home, Jerusalem. I did not hear this word mentioned or, or stressed in our discussion. As a teen, do you, any of you have insight into constructive ways to address nationalism in her generation in light of the comments on Lemkin? Thank you for the question and thank you for the, for the information about the documentary, which I believe can be found on, on YouTube for those who would like to see it. And I'll ask you all to unmute yourselves and if anybody would like to comment on this issue of nationalism and how it figures into this discussion, whether the nationalism of the Operation Nemesis operatives, or uh, of of, of the uh, of Talat Pasha on the receiving end, as it were, or or in the trial itself. Please don't talk over each other. I. I would uh, just throw in one thought that sh it, it got touched on, I think, by Stefan. Um, and that is the Ottoman Empire was run by, well, the head of the Ottoman Empire was the Sultan. And the subjects, I think st somebody used the term subjects, those are the people who live in his realm. And according to law, they belong to him. He owns them. He owns everything that everybody has and every person in the Ottoman Empire. This, is, this has to be thought of in contrast to what a citizen is in the world we live in. And then when you look at the world we live in, or let's say the United States, we have over the couple of hundred years that there's been a United States defined what a citizen is differently over time. And that can have an effect in the way people were thinking about what can and can't be done to the people of a country by the government. Uh, also, I think it's important to note that although the term genocide was coined in the middle of the 20th century, genocide of course had been happening for centuries, probably all the way back to the beginning of time. And genocide was, especially in the 19th century, the way things got done I mean, over why was the United why did the United States object to it? Because it was one of the ways the United States ran its country was using genocide, as did all these other major empires. So, um, not decide that take the side of the Turks, but that is, I think, part of their thinking of why are you why is Britain and the United States saying things about what we're what we did when you did similar things. And it all comes down to defining who are the people of a nation or who are the citizens or the subjects. I wonder if I can come in on, on, on the, the question of nationalism. It's obviously a really important question. And it's a question for our times, not just in Israel, but Britain, the United States, Poland, Hungary. I suppose one of the things that I've become interested in, and, and I, I want to put this on the table, when I was writing East West Street, I wanted to get the subject of what had happened and what I was writing about, if you like, out of the ghetto. For the Holocaust of the Jews between 33 and 45, the Jewish community has a particular interest. For the genocide of the Armenians, the Armenian community has a particular interest. And I think what's interesting for me is how do we find the points of connection between these different stories? Eric is absolutely right. If you go through Lemkin's original notes, some of which you can find in the New York archives. He, he gathered, you know, centuries, millennia 
of horrors that people had committed. And what he did for the first time in his book published in November 44 was to look, was to realize that it was a step-by-step -step process. It's not that there is nationalism, it's that it starts with something small. It starts with defining the other in a particular way. Then the other becomes uh, a problem. Then you have to restrict the other in certain ways in terms of employment, in terms of where they live, in terms of this, that, and the other. And one thing eventually leads um, all the way to mass murder. And it, it, this conversation makes me think of a remarkable video that was produced after the events in the United States on the 6th of January, uh, the insurrection on the Capitol by Arnold Schwarzenegger, the former governor of California. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's an incredible video. He basically says, look, I'm Austrian. I know about these things. Mm -hmm. One thing he doesn't say is my father was a Nazi because as my Austrian friends say, no Austrian can say those words. <laughs> Um, just as no Turk can say, my grandfather was a genocidaire or whatever. But I think the question is partly about nationalism and partly it's about finding the, the, the incremental steps and the warning signs that lead to the kinds of things that happened in 1915, the kinds of things that happened in the 1930s, the kinds of things that seem to be happening today in Myanmar and in China. And I think, Carla, as you make your film, and as we all, each of us with our own areas of interest get involved, I think the key is to always step back and look at the bigger picture. And what are the commonalities behind these stories? As you were speaking, Carla, I was amazed. I checked with my book, I'd, I'd forgotten. One of the prosecutors at the famous Nuremberg trial, the big one, the famous one, was a wonderful German jurist. Stefan, you may have come across him, Robert Kempner. Yes. Kempner spent. Yes, he did. He sat in on the trial and he wrote about it and it inspired him for the work that he did. And what I'm interested in, and the nationalism question sort of raises it, is the points of commonality, the points of connection, the crossovers on these issues. It is fascinating. And for me, nationalism, I was I was reacting to that question very narrowly with regard to the trial, because there's an interesting question raised by the trial of the German state. And as Stefan outlined, there was pressure on that trial to have it short, to try not to have it, you know, spill over into questions of German complicity or German guilt. And you could take that a step further and say, well, maybe if you're looking at it from the national self-interest of Germany and the Weimar Republic at that time, which was, which was fragile, uh, maybe that was a good thing to not have Germany blamed. Could the new democratic republic hold itself together if it was going to be fractured with a discussion of German war guilt and German complicity in what was then not called a genocide, but was mass murder. And this question was raised um, in, and has been raised in, in other countries that are looking at how do we process what happened before in Latin America, there's a play called Death and the Maiden, many of you will know, where you know there's a new democratic Latin American country and, and suddenly uh, somebody's war crimes come out. Is it a good idea to explore those openly and then try to have the nation heal from them to have some form of restorative justice? Or could the simple act of exploring those fissures actually break the country apart? And it's a valid question to ask, even though of course it's Armenians, we're saying, well, of course they have to talk about it. Of course they have to look at who was guilty. But when you rise above it and say, right, okay, it's not so easy when you're actually the leader, right? And there were social Democrats who were leaders and they were trying to kind of hold the line between the right and the left. So when you look at it that way, the question of national interest, which is different than nationalism, it's still important to consider, especially with regard to the Tellerian trial. Another very interesting question here. Uh, and it remarks that Talat, uh, among others, was tried and convicted in absentia in, in uh, the waning days of the Ottoman Empire. And he had escaped, of course, to Germany uh, to, to 
in part to avoid this. Did this fact uh, come into play during the trial that he had been tried in absentia in his in his home country? It did, yeah, it did. Um, but it it basically immediately, um, you know, was transformed in this question. The the judge asks Telerian, but you know that you're not allowed to execute sentences by some other court and all of these things. And this is part basically of the whole introduction of the of the uh, trial and this channeling towards motivations, the bigger picture, and genocide and everything. But you know, it's been it was also part of the debate in the press before. Um, there was also a lot of criticism against the government. Why are they harboring these people, Enver, uh, Jemal, and Talat in Germany? Um, and, you know, there were very interesting debates. Um, for example, Jemal, he wrote an op-ed as a reply to the um, documents um, edited by Lepsius that I mentioned, for example. And there you can actually see that he's validating this collection, you know, about the Armenian genocide, because he's trying to say, no, but I did something good here and there. But then he's quoting other documents in this, uh, you know. So Talat was a bit more hidden, but people knew that these were these people were around in Germany. They intervened, you know, and this was part of the criticism before the trial even opened, you know. How is it possible that they're here and that we... You know, there were all these publications, the murderers among us and all these things, how the Republic is uh, protecting them and such. Were there also concerns in Germany? Uh, this is another question that, that has been posed, that individual German officers might be uh, charged with, with uh, war crimes or, or whatever they could have been charged with uh, under the circumstances. Look, inadvertently, I'm really pushing uh, historical newspaper analysis here because my next question is also connected to that. So the, and there was another question also here in our Q&A uh, panel. Um, <clears throat> it's very difficult, you know, to, to have a clear assessment of the role of Germany in um, aiding on the ground and advising on the ground the Armenian genocide. Um, the archives were destroyed. I mean, they were probably, you know, uh, curated before already, but uh, during the Second World War, much of the military archives were destroyed, so we don't know much. There is one officer who, in the German press, also in an op-ed, Feldmann, actually admitted that they were advising the Ottomans, you know, in genocide. <clears throat> um, but other than that, I think the Foreign Office uh, did a good job of keeping them out, kind of defending them. They wanted one of the consuls definitely not to speak at the trial. That was important for them. That was a very pro-Armenian consul, one of many. Um, so this was very important indeed. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there is a bigger background, right? Um, international justice and in international treaties are a bit de delegitimized in these years in Germany. There's also, you know, this idea of a war, war crimes um, trial in Leipzig in Germany in these years. And um, it's not something, you know, this kind of international morality is not working too well. And this, again, the national prison is very important for all these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, Edward, in his opening statement, mentions Tessa Hoffman, and uh, anybody who wants to get deeper into this topic can look at it, particularly uh, the Armenian Review, Winter 1989, Volume 42, Numbers, well, whatever. You can find it. It's in the Armenian Review, New Aspects of the Talat Pasha Court Case. And um, clearly it was a very sensitive topic, as Stefan was saying, they, they were negotiating the peace treaties at the same time that this trial was going on. Um, th there are some aspects to the German relationship to the Ottoman Empire at this time that it's just, if nothing else, just look at the technology. The Krupp's armaments uh, were significant uh, war making instruments and the Germans knew how to run them and they could be like in Vaughn, they could be extremely destructive. You could just aim them at the Armenian community. There they are, they're right up there on the hill. We'll just reduce that part of the city to rubble. And uh, the Germans had to do that. Not to mention the Baghdad Railroad, which was being built. And I think was sort of, uh, it was an idea as well as a railroad because it would open up all this territory for, for farmland in Eastern uh, Anatolia, or not Anatolia, Asia Minor, I guess, the more specific. 
And related to that are the telegrams, which were an important part of the trial. Even though they were not read aloud during the trial, they were entered into the court record. And, and for many who, who are reading the English translation of the trial, you will not see those telegrams at the end of the, of the English translation. But if you look at the German stenographic version, you'll see that the telegrams were entered into the court record. And these telegrams were from Aram Andonian, the Turkish telegrams. Um, they mysteriously went missing after the trial. They were never retrieved. There's a whole mystery about them. What happened to them? Was there a conspiracy? Blah, blah, blah. But the sources of, of these telegrams, whether they were real, whether they were forged, became a whole thing in the academic literature. You can read about it if you're interest, interested. But, but what's important about it is, from the German point of view, the question is about what did Germany know or the German officers, is that the Germans did know about these Turkish telegrams. I mean, we, you know, it's not like the Turkish telegrams exist, existed in a vacuum. Germany was the ally of, of Turkey. And so, of course, they would have seen this telegram traffic. It wasn't anything new. So um, it, there is this odd sort of dichotomy in the trial of bringing things to light, but then sort of holding down um, any sort of great circulation about what was going on. The telegrams is a good example of that. There are a couple of questions relating to the issue of uh, British intelligence and whether there was official or documented evidence of uh, British intelligence interacting with Nemesis. Uh, I know, Eric, this is one of your favorite subjects, so uh, perhaps you would like to address that and anyone else too. Well, this is a, this is a topic that requires much more research. I have, um, I, I did as much as I could. I mean, I have to say that when I first sat down to write my book, I was just going to recapitulate everything that I could find on the topic, and that would be my book. I wasn't planning on doing primary research. Uh, but it isn't that hard to find stuff. Uh, Aubrey Herbert, who was a uh, diplomat slash spy slash orientalist, Aubrey Herbert was the last Brit to speak to uh, Talat. He was sent um, by Scotland Yard to Germany when Talat wanted to open up a back channel to Great Britain while he was hiding out in Germany. And in his autobiography, Aubrey Herbert spends an entire chapter talking about his discussions with Talat. And this is in February of 1921. And uh, I, I covered a lot of it in my book. Uh, you can also get the book, Ben Kendim is the name of the book. It's, it's, it's about a lot of things that Aubrey Herbert did. But um, he goes back to Scotland Yard and he is debriefed and basically he says, uh, Talat is threatening us to keep this civil war going forever unless we, uh, we start make nice with them. Now, I don't understand how you jump from that. I couldn't find the jumping from that to Kamal. That's conjecture on my part. What I do know is that Aubrey Herbert went back, was debriefed in Scotland Yard, and uh, Talat was dead three weeks later. And two other pieces that I would put into this, if you really carefully sift through what Tetlerion was up to, what Operation Nemesis was up to, and you put aside what they say they were doing, especially according to Tetlerion's autobiography that was published in the 50s, uh, they weren't able to find Talat. They claim that they found Talat by standing next to this train that was on its way to Rome and they figured it out and he took a picture and he scratched off his mustache and he figured out that was Tala. But an easier way to look at it is Aubrey Herbert goes back to uh, England and um, the next thing you know, the Armenians know where Talat is living exactly. And we know from, if you really look through all the memoirs very carefully, you see that the Armenians are getting communications from Geneva which is where uh, a major ARF uh, not node is at the, uh, at the uh, editorial offices of Droshak. And so it's easy to see that the Brits who, oh, by the way, I, my research shows that the Brits always knew exactly where Talat was living on Hardenbergstrasse. 
that the Brits basically said to themselves, and, and by the way, the Turks have been saying this for 30 years, um, we don't have to kill this guy. We'll just tell the Armenians where he's living. And the way I look at it, they told somebody in Geneva, somebody in Geneva told the guys in Berlin. That is the date at which Tetlerian moves across the street to where Talat was living on Hardenbergstrasse. So then you have to look at the motivation of why are the Brits doing this? And this is where we don't have that information as far as is there a back channel with Kamal at this point? Kamal is fighting with the Brits in, in Anatolia at this point. It's a civil war. Now, we do know that Aubrey Herbert was planning to go and visit Kamal in Turkey and was told not to go. Then you have to look at British politics at that period. Aubrey Herbert is part of a people, uh, part of a group who are against, uh, who are in, in uh, conflict with the leading party in Britain at the time. They think the people running Britain at the time are basically dupes and are not doing things properly. I would conjecture that um, Nigel Thompson, who was his uh, Aubrey Herbert's boss at Scotland Yard, and Aubrey Herbert acted without approval from 10 Downing Street and knocked off and told the Armenians where Talat was and, and resulting in Talat's death. If you follow that line of thought, what's interesting is that Basil Thompson is uh, removed from head of Scotland Yard about four years later, which is kind of interesting because the way he's removed is he is uh, caught with a prostitute in Hyde Park. And the question is, how does the guy who's running Scotland Yard get busted for picking up a prostitute? I can't even imagine how you, that could happen uh, unless uh, Downing Street found out that these guys had helped Talat out the door. And in that way, they were like, look, you can't do things like this. You can't take the law into your own hands. I'm talking about Basil Thompson, Scotland Yard. You can't knock off possibly a head of another country. Certainly Talat was head of that country at the end of the war. So this is, uh, and why would they be doing all of this? And oil, you got to keep looking at the oil. There's a lot of oil in Iraq, a lot, a lot of oil. There were things that there was a big prize. It's called the prize in the famous book. So, um, Britain understood, Churchill certainly understood, Britain understood by the end of World War I that whoever controlled the oil would control the world. They understood by the end of World War I that uh, battleships had to be run on oil, not coal, and that you couldn't even run airplanes at all unless you had petroleum. And so all of a sudden, petroleum became really big and the Ottoman Empire controlled a vast amount of oil. So. It's like a murder mystery, but somebody has to do this research. Now, I went into the archive in, um, in Britain, and the one thing that's interesting, and I'll leave it at this, and I've told you this, Mark, Aubrey Herbert fastidiously keeps a journal where he enters every single day of his life. The day that he doesn't enter a journal entry is the day Talat is killed. The next day, he says that he read in the newspaper that Talat had been gunned down in Berlin. Why would he have to read it in the newspaper? He had literally been face to face with the man three weeks earlier. Certainly in his spy network, somebody would have picked up the phone and told him that Talat had just been gunned down in Berlin. Why would he have to read it in the newspaper? I think it's baloney. And uh, I invite somebody, some industrious person out there to keep digging. Yeah, there may be a book in that. One more question I'd uh, like to ask uh, for, for Philip mainly, I think, uh, and, and that is, if I can put it this way, if you can reflect on the, uh, the understanding and the perception of Lemkin today uh, as opposed to, say, 20, 25 years ago uh, when he was outside of a small circle of, of scholars and historians, I think, very little known. And through the efforts of, of writers such as yourself, Lemkin is now seen as being at the center of, of uh, what, what became genocide and human rights law and, and advocacy. If, if you could 
offer us some thoughts on that before we sign yeah, off. Well, I mean, he's plainly a remarkable character. Um, I think he would be disappointed with what has happened. I think he would be very concerned at the way in which the debate about genocide has gone. Um, and in particular, the way in which the numbers bar has been set very, very high. Um, and for, for Lemkin, you know, it would be sufficient if you had a small community of a small village, uh, you know, three people from one community, three from another, and three from a third. If two of the communities gang up and kill the three from one community, that's a genocide. But the definition in the convention sets a very high bar, it does two things that he would not, that he did not like. He had to, he had to cut a deal to make this happen. Um, the first thing that it does is it requires the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. That's very, very difficult to prove, um, which I know to my own cost. Secondly, the states that adopted the treaty excluded what he thought was the most important aspect, a cultural genocide, destroying not the bodies of human beings, but their sense of community, their culture, their books, their poetry, their films, their whatever. And that was cut out of the, the final definition as put into the treaty. And in a sense, I think he'd also be disappointed by the fact that he's become a victim of his own success. Um, and you see that right now on the story with the Uyghurs. I'm not sure that what's happening to the Uyghurs is a genocide in law. It's terrible. It's a crime. It's certainly a crime against humanity. But does it meet the standard of the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part as it's been applied by international courts and tribunals? On genocide's Lemkin definition, he would say that's genocide. That's what I meant by genocide. But I don't think it's easily going to get past the legal threshold. And the question arises, why have we fetishized this word? Um, genocides are not worse than crimes against humanity. You know, I sit on an advisory panel, um, uh, the UK Holocaust Memorial Day, where the British Holocaust Memorial Day organizers commemorate other acts of mass killing, um, not just the murder of Jews. And I said on the advisory panel, well, how do you decide which acts of horror you're gonna commemorate? There's so many. And they said, oh, well, we've, we've been given, I mean, I listened to the debate about the Foreign Office and the British and uh, absolutely right. I mean, <laughs> more likely than not, uh, their hand was behind in some way. And they said, oh, well, we've got, we've got Foreign Office guidelines. Oh, yeah. I said, what's that? And they said, well, first, it has to have happened after 1945. I said, well, very convenient. So you don't have to say anything about the Turks, the Ottomans, the Armenians. Yes, that's quite right. We can ignore that. We don't have to mark that. And secondly, an international court or tribunal must have characterized the act of mass murder as a genocide. And I said, okay, let me see if I've understood this correctly. So the killing of 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men at Srebrenica, which has been characterized as a genocide, you will commemorate that. But the murder of 3 million human beings in the Democratic Republic of Congo at exactly the same time, you will pass in silence because no international court has called it a genocide, just a crime against humanity or just war crimes. Correct. So what's the social function of that? You know, there is an element of all of this debate that actually a lot of people in Turkey recognize that a million people or more were murdered. What they object to is that the G word is attached to it. And it causes me to ask the question, why are we so hung up about this word? If an American president says, oh, look, crime against humanity is happening over there, a war crime, no one pays the blindest attention. It's not in the papers, doesn't make it anywhere. The moment an American president says it's genocide, everyone goes, oh, must be really bad. We better look into it. And that's why I think in part the term genocide has been weaponized. What's going on right now in relation to the Uyghurs, for many, many people, it's the horror of what's happening to the Uyghurs. But for a whole group of others, it's about a battle that's going on with China now. And the Turkish, Armenian, and many other acts of mass atrocity and horror have become pawns in a bigger debate about geopolitical issues in which the G word comes to be weaponized and used. And I think Lemkin, who is a remarkable human being by any standard, very 
complex. I mean, I have met a couple of people. Ben Ferenc, someone asked a question about Ben Ferenc. And, uh, ben Ferenc said he was a pain in the ass. He would, he would come and irritate us. He'd turn up at the trial. We just wanted to get off on with our work and prosecute all these Nazis. And he'd, he'd come up and he'd be unkempt and he'd, he'd drive us crazy. But Ben Ferenc loved him and he was remarkable but he drove people crazy. And I think he would not be happy with the direction things have taken. Well, on that note, let us conclude. Uh, I know it's late night in uh, Israel where Stefan is and he wants to go to sleep. And uh, I really thank you all across a, a wide time and space spectrum uh, on the panel for joining us today, as well as the audience along a similar spectrum. Um, it's an interesting and important anniversary. And thank you again, Carla, for initiating this event and allowing us to bring together this, this terrific panel. And uh, once again, uh, many positive comments uh on on zoom and on youtube as well thanking you for your for your contributions and i thank you as well have a good day have a good night and see you next time thank you thank you all thank you so much bye, -bye.